Podcast. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to the Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by the Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, CEO and founder, and I am honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through paying it forward and giving back. Ethical business owners and holistic healers who are determined to create collective change in the world. Once we have a change in consciousness and through collective change, we can become one. My next guest was recommended to me by another guest in the act of paying it forward. When the COVID-19 pandemic grounded us all globally, it was a great opportunity for me to catch up and connect with change makers like this amazing lady. Sam Scrivia is the founder and CEO of Ministry of Waste, based in the UK. Originally from Latvia, Sam now is on a mission to create and execute waste management systems for polluted and disadvantaged communities in developing countries. Less plastic in the ocean, brands acting responsibly and more revenue for local communities. It's that simple. Sam is currently focusing on Indonesia to tackle the tons of waste that goes unmanaged and ends up in the marine environment whilst empowering locals. I honestly could have sat with Sam for hours on this subject, so I hope you soak up the inspiration and passion for collective change in this episode. Welcome, Sam, to The Ethical Evolution. Hello, and thank you for having me. Now, you're coming to us from the UK at the moment. We were just having a bit of a chat off air about how our lives have been through COVID-19, and uh, you're originally from Latvia, um, so if people are trying to pick up your accent, can you tell us a bit about you? and what you do, and most importantly, how the Ministry of Waste came about. Uh, okay, I'll try to summarize <laughs> as, as much as possible, otherwise this might take a long time. <laughs> so I was born and raised in Latvia. Mm-hmm. I left um, after one year of studies for an Erasmus exchange. It's like a program where you're allowed to travel to another European country. Mm-hmm. I ended up going to Germany. Um, but then I decided to stay and actually do my bachelor's degree in Germany. When I finished that, I went to France where I started work and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then did my master's degree in business because I've known for a long time that I wanted to have my own business. So I kind of thought it probably would be good to go, um, the route of degree because France loves paperwork (laughs) so I did that I did a very um, short stint in London with my previous job where I lived in London for one and a half years Uh, and actually Ministry of Waste was kind of born during that time so um, so I've been kind of preparing to start my own company for about 10 years which is quite a long time you know how people say one night success, overnight success, whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, no, this this is first of all, it's not even success just yet. Yeah, <laughs> but it's been uh, ten years in the making now, fifteen years in the making almost. Um, and yeah, so I, I I very thorough like was one step at a time preparing to start my own company. I knew that there's a lot to do. There's money to be saved to obviously kick off something, and um. I wasn't quite sure. I'm. I have a lot of ideas. Like I have a book. You know those people that have a little book by the yeah. bedside on the bedside table. That's yeah. me. Yeah. I have. Like I would say, wake up in the middle of the night. Oh, that would be a nice business idea. Yeah. I like. I scribble a lot of things down because then I go back to the book. I review, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. But this was born very. Uh, I was looking at a couple of other things, uh, and then um, I went to Philippines for one month mm-hmm. with. A movie that we were making which is quite weird I guess I don't know people would be like so what's this person doing <laughs> stuff so I just say yes to things and my yep. friends are a bit crazy so one of my friends decided he wants to make a movie about free diving so he put me in the movie he's like let's go so we were like 11 people with as well an Aussie by the way on the filming crew which is really cool so we assembled people from across the world almost in Philippines for one yeah. month and 
we traveled around Philippines to a lot of spots where there was literally no one Mm -hmm. apart from us. So we would have to travel with the motorbike for three, four hours sometimes to a very secluded beach. And it was quite shocking to me that sometimes we couldn't film or we had to stop filming because we were in the water and uh, the tide would be coming in or, you know, some ocean currents uh, and there would be plastic everywhere. Mm. And it's the first time I was in Asia and or like actually spending lots of time in Asia. And it sh- was shocking to me. And we did lots of ble- beach cleanups because yeah. we just felt so responsible. And then you see the local people not really caring about, mm. like, they're like, why are you doing this? And then someone else chucking stuff while you're cleaning things oh, into God. the ocean, for example. <laughs> yeah. The, the ver- I think it, at this moment already it sounds very um, cliche, you know, so many people have told this story, but I, I experienced yeah. this story now four years ago. And I was shocked and I was trying to think a lot, like, why is this happening? And I'm, a, I guess, like an empathic person and I wasn't thinking right away, oh, like, these locals must be so uneducated, which a lot of people say. And by the way, we can get into that another point. Well, yeah. it's been, uh, every time someone says that, it makes me so mad. Mm. So I was trying to understand what is this? And I kind of could see that it might be a systematic problem than just, you know, a human problem. And we wrapped up the filming. I came back to my job in London and I just couldn't forget think Like I just couldn't forget about it. So I kept on thinking about it. I kept on dreaming about it. I had nightmares about mm. it. And then I joined an incubator in London while I was still working full time to try and see, try and figure out how maybe I can bring, you know, a a solution that might be part of the puzzle that might become the solution. Mm -hmm. And then Ministry of Waste was born out of two pivots out of those ideas, because, you know, it's kind of, you think, oh, this might work. And then you think this might work. And then actually when I landed, um, so I actually ended up not going back to Philippines, but it went to Indonesia. And when I landed in Indonesia, very luckily, um, in a quite short period of time, I managed to meet some local government officials mm-hmm. uh, to whom I presented my f- like kind of second iteration of idea where I wanted to do beach cleanups by actually paying people instead of doing voluntarily because there's many volunteer organizations doing it, but it's not sustainable. It's not, you know, it doesn't last. And if you want to do something that lasts, you need to do it like every day. Mm. And I was ready to pay someone because... There were clients ready to pay for the material that you gather because obviously there's this now whole you might even question greenwashing around mm. beach ocean plastic whatever that's another point we <laughs> talk about if you want to um but um yeah so why not pay people if i'm getting paid for the material um acquired or or gathered or cleaned from beaches and i presented that idea to the local government officials let's say and they were quite funny because they were like, that's a really nice idea. But what about all the other trash we have a problem with? Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? They were like, well, can't you, if you can do that, why don't you just take care of all of the trash of like this particular island where I ended up going? Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how literally Ministry of Waste was born. Because as well, in if you are a good listener in business school. They always tell you, don't do something because you want to do something. Mm. Do something that actually is needed and that people are asking you for. And it took me a long time from that moment that I said yes to actually fully embracing that now we are a waste management company, not a beach cleanup or supplier of beach plastics or something. Like this. No, we are fully fledged, integrated waste management company. And like I had to, gr- I have a feeling I had to grow into the shoes and I'm still growing into those shoes. Yeah. Probably will never stop growing <laughs> in them. Um, but yeah, it took some time to embrace it. But I feel very strongly that that's the right thing to do because that's what the people constantly tell me they need. And obviously there's been a lot of positives that um, reconfirmed that it's the right choice or yeah. the right thing to do. 
Yeah, and um, you know, through through doing this podcast, I speak to people around the world, and um, a friend of yours who recommended I speak with you, uh, Flavio uh, from New Oceans, um, he um, had very similar experience experiences to you, and and does help with those uh, the ocean cleanup kind of stuff. But I also think back to another guest I had in New Zealand who was originally from the UK and had, you know, gone to Indonesia and experienced the plastic waves in the ocean. And it's sad that I'm hearing this story from so many guests, but you're all making that same impact. So when we talk about impact, what would you say your mission is for Ministry of Waste? It's actually very nice that you're using the word impact i mm. actually have chosen it's gonna be my word of the year yes <laughs> because every time i read an article or every time there's a new you know announcement about funding investment or any company doing anything my very first question is but what is the impact of this what are they actually doing what is the you know like d- don't just clap at every single time you hear like for example a company would say oh yes we're saving one million bottles one million bottles represents literally nothing yeah, like nothing. On, on, on purpose they've used you know in my I've, I've studied marketing too and i know how like you hear one million bottles oh my god it sounds so much but then if you actually know the material and know how light it is it's like representing one you know one container mm. and you're just like one container is nothing so that impact like especially if i compare to how much money has gone into doing it and then obviously the PR campaign around it I'm just like this is even negative you're going Mm. into negatives with the material you claim you've uh, saved from the ocean Um, so the impact we'd want to have so maybe without going into too much um, like technicalities uh, when I say we are a waste management company it means we build infrastructure so fairly large facilities that collects uh, not collects but receives uh, collected domestic waste so mm-hmm. it's usually meat and when like I look at our impact numbers that we're estimating and we want to have which is based on very strong statistics uh, I'm not making these numbers up um, it can be you know several tens of thousand tons per one location of plastic but there's then other materials uh, actually saved and just given a new life so what our facilities are there for literally we create a public-private par- partnership with the local government. Uh, we tell them as well, you don't need to have the funding. That's what we are raising uh, for you if you can't. If you can, that just means things will go quicker. Mm. So at the moment, we have our first five locations which um, already have the funding found within the government, which is really lovely. It just makes things easier for yeah. us. And all the other locations that we have uh, sourced, and now we have like a 70 location plan for the whole of Indonesia, wow. which is fairly large. Uh, it's like a life project for me <laughs> and my team. Um, for We are currently raising, we'll continue raising until we have all these uh, facilities in place. But so basically a public-private partnership where the government um, gives us land, either on a rental basis or for free, depends on the arrangement that they can have. Uh, we're happy with anything. Um, then they are responsible legally for the collection. So they mm-hmm. collect. Actually, a lot of uh, local governments already do the collection. It's just it goes to the landfill. And they don't collect everything because of various reasons. Mm. Um, they're, not, they're not waste managers. They don't know how to manage a fleet. They don't know, you know, they don't have the... Um, I don't want to say they don't have access, but they don't quite understand that there's fleet management softwares. Like this is where we come in and we say, well, we will help you with that. We will actually make it more efficient and less, you know, cost, I mean, more cost effective and all all those things, which they're really happy to hear. And then once that trash, let's say the trash is collected, it comes to our facilities. And then we have um, machinery, but we use a lot of um, human labor too. So it's kind of a a mix between the, the two because actually, Indonesian, let's say, waste pickers, uh, which are the people we want to actually hire and offer like a full employment, social mm. care, retirement, um, the whole package are much better than any fancy spectrometer that we could put uh, in a European type uh, facility. So it's going to be quite an Indonesian context facility, but at the same time, making it as efficient and as good for the local context we possibly can and sorting out the materials and then making sure that this material 
um, gets a new life, preferably locally too. So that's my in, internal mantra because when we talk about impact, so is it all about, oh, I'm doing this, I'm saving stuff from the ocean or is it, are you looking at the globe, like the bigger picture mm. and the bigger system? I guess I'm quite a system thinker too. Like I, and when I present it to the local government, they li- really love this idea that I say, we're not going to ship I mean, as much as we can, we're going to keep in the local economy, be that cardboard, be that aluminum, you you, you pick it and see how we can enable local business owners or, you know, entrepreneurs or just people that are motivated that want to do something of their own to have that material locally, because that means more jobs locally, Mm. better economy locally. And it just enables so many other things. Like I can tell you later a story that like perfectly matches exactly what I'm trying to to do <laughs> in, in one of the locations where we want to build. That's incredible. Um, so it's really a holistic kind of 360 system that you've you've got happening there, which I think is just beautiful. I mean, uh, are you looking at taking it beyond Indonesia? Yes. Mm. Um, we are min- we are very tiny, but we have huge ambitions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'd love and how I always try to present is that Indonesia is a big start. Like we could have started this in a smaller country, but I think Indonesia just really has this issue of archipelago, so many islands, mm. and we struggle because they always think about oh where are we gonna ship this? And my mindset is no no no. How can you use it locally without having to ship it somewhere? Mm. And um. Yes, beyond Indonesia for sure. So depending on how much investment we raise and how quick our investors as well want us to move into other geographies. Like I'd love to have um, a team for Africa dedicated because oh, yeah. I have so many African countries, you know, calling and saying we need exactly that solution. We are in a similar situation, even though we're not islands. And I'm like, I, I completely understand. Mm. Uh, I did some consultation last year with Nepal which is quite interesting because Nepalese villages are very similar to Indonesian islands because they're just in the mountains, yeah. not in water, but it's exactly the same situation. Like they can't get the stuff out. The stuff is mm. easy to come in, but how do you get it out of the mountain villages? And then, yeah, we, we talked about possible solutions and they, they'd like to have our solutions there too. Uh, and then everywhere else really in developing countries, I think the focus probably would be first in Southeast Asia or Asia in general. So mm. Malaysia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, uh, Thai, Thailand, Vietnam, um, lots of contacts there. But already the work in Indonesia is such a big chunk of the big elephant. So it all depends on how things would move forward. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And, you know, something um, that I – have been speaking about since the beginning of COVID is, and, you know, when we talk about waste, we talk about anything really. Um, Something that really became obvious to me is what you do today affects my tomorrow. doesn't matter that you're in the UK and I'm here in Brisbane. Like we're all on this same planet together. And I think the moment we get that mindset shift that, you know, we've got to be mindful of everyone around us. And I think COVID's really given that a really physical, visible thing, you know, like a tangible thing for us to see how much we impact others. And, yeah, um, totally. you know, in, in the work that you're doing, no doubt you see that as well. Yes, especially obviously UK and Indonesia in particular even more so mm. due to how much waste UK exports abroad mm. and how much actually – or how many of, or how much of the local population has no idea that that's hap- like literally no idea that that's happening. Yeah. Uh, so that's when I think now we can touch a little bit on the oh why the locals not educated. We should educate them. Um, so I have um, British people that would tell me, oh yeah, we should just start like you should start the educational campaign. I'm like, maybe we should start an educational campaign in UK mm. because for example, statistics of 2018, everyone sits down and listen. It's 60,000 tons of UK waste alone that went to Indonesia alone. I'm not even talking about Malaysia. I'm not talking about Sri Lanka. I'm not talking about about other countries. But Indonesia is very high there. And I personally have seen those mountains. I've Mm. been to mountains of waste where I pick up 
pick up M&S and Tesco packaging no. <laughs> and you can see, you know, made in UK and you can see it's like a, it's a UK food I would consume in yeah. UK. And then, yeah, so every time people say that to me, um, I get really frustrated <laughs> and I try to breathe and hmm, count till 10 and then I kind of tell them, well, the situation is very complex and they don't need to be educated. They actually should be given infrastructure before we dump our stuff uh, with them. Mm. And then we create ocean funds and accelerators <laughs> to help. It's just crazy. Like to me, I could talk for hours about mm. this, how how the system is yeah, just very weird. How it's we so then broken. play the saviors when we are sending stuff there. Um, so yeah, and... It's interesting as well because in my work, um, I have to spend a lot of time convincing local people that I'm not just a white person mm. trying to pretend I'm, you know, saving them. Uh, I actually have a local Indonesian co-founder, which helps. And all my team locally is Indonesian. Like yeah. I haven't sent any expats there because I just think it's completely not needed. There's mm. like they're extremely educated there's yeah. amazing universities locally in indonesia so why why do you need to import uh expats into the country so that's not needed um and that i think has helped to establish that yeah i'm not there like i'm gonna save you from all the past things yeah no no, no. I'm, I'm just here because i feel i'm a bit of an enabler just through my thinking and putting the puzzle pieces together but they can help themselves um so yeah I wow. don't know if that's answered the question. Absolutely, <laughs> but, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, and it was more a statement than a question, but um, yeah, like so on the same page and like I can just, I can sense the impact that you're going to have in, in coming years, particularly in, in Southeast Asia. I just think it's going to be massive. So what kind of difference have you made so far in the work that you do? Good question. Um, I, I'll be honest, I don't think I've made – in terms of actual impact on the environment, I don't think I've made any big difference just because to build infrastructure is such an unsexy thing and mm. it takes such a long time. Like I can as well, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's me. Maybe it's just the way I want to go about it. Like sometimes people tell me, oh, just start a waste bank, you know, do something. And I'm like, but that do something already exists. There's already thousands of waste banks around Indonesia and they don't work. Mm. So why would I, as, as a white person, go there and do another waste bank? What's the point? Like they can do, they can create their own waste bank. If change is about to happen, I need to make that change happen. And, and I'm not going to be okay with just doing a half ass something, you know? Yeah. So I'd rather stick to my big guns and I know it's going to take some time and it's not easy, yeah, because when you go to speak to the locals, they're like, oh, but can we do this? And I told them, well, please, you you can do that. But I need to focus on raising the money to do this big thing because mm. it's needed. Because I know that that's going to make the very big difference. Um, the only thing maybe I could say, I've helped the local people see that the change is possible mm -hmm. and that to allow them or, or maybe give them an opportunity to think a bit bigger and like the bigger picture and, but local bigger picture too. So mm. maybe it's a good time to, to, to showcase this one example. So I went to a location, which is in um, North of Sumatra. So it's actually the Aceh region, which has the Sharia law, by the way, which has very bad reputation. I love it there. I've never been, you know, treated as nice as that region people have been treating me. Um, there's a lot of women in, in power positions, so it's not as bad as the media is, is painting it. Um, but I went to a particular location where they do, uh, they grow coffee. So actually they supply, I think, 80% of Starbucks coffee. Wow. So but don't get any much help from Starbucks. <laughs> By the way, hey, anybody from Starbucks listening, please, uh, yeah. you should maybe do some CSR locally. That could mm. quite help people um so yes yeah, so they grow co coffee predominantly for starbucks uh, but as well other brands and so obviously a lot of the focus is on coffee 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 mm -hmm. uh, i go there um it's quite mountainous because coffee obviously prefers to grow quite high mm -hmm. um so and waste is literally in every river because people would just chuck it over you know chuck yeah. it over the whatever cliff into the river mm -hmm. and it just gets washed away it's not that problem 
And so down down the stream, then other locations are complaining. We get, we get swamped with with plastic waste from upstream and yeah. all, all those geographical political issues. Um, but I noticed because that region is quite um, the the land is really fertile. They grow other things too. You have a lot of uh, veggie farmers, so you, they grow a lot of avocado. They grow a lot of tomatoes. Um, but between different locations, you sometimes have to drive seven hours, eight hours, which is a very long journey, even for me. And I'm not a tomato. (laughs) So, and, um, so I'm going to the, so I do a lot of audits when I go to locations. So me personally, myself, I just walk around, have a look, stock everything, try to understand, try to understand how does the local economy work? So how do goods get moved? Where do they go? Look at the market waste, because that's quite a big problem too, usually for them, because several tons a day you would have within the market area. Yeah. And they don't know what to do with it. And it's a lot of biological waste. It's really a shame. Mm. It's actually going to the landfill and not been done something with. Uh, and I see that these avocado and tomato predominantly farmers are struggling because the tomatoes are just going off quite quickly Mm -hmm. and obviously the other cities are quite far away and I noticed that they don't even have a very simple thing that I'm so used to seeing in supermarkets those cardboard trays Mm. where you just kind of put them in a nice round shape you know and they kind of sit nicely and then you put the next one on top so my first thought was like in the meeting I asked them the locals I'm like why is nobody making paper trays for your goods so that you can like locally just stack them and then, you know, ship them to the city next, that is eight hours, but they don't grow the same things because I was in that location and I know they don't. Mm. Uh, That means that they don't have to import things from like the bigger city, but rather help the local smaller farmers. And you could literally see the light bulb moment for like 20 people happening at the same time. They were like, you can do that. I'm like, well, yes, if we gather the cardboard, and we separate it out, but we don't send it to, you know, the capital city, of mm. the, the, which is 10 hours away. But we give it to a local entrepreneur here. I can even help him get the machine. It's such a simple machine to make, uh, to make these cardboard, uh, whatever you call them. <laughs> uh, then that person can obviously sell them to the local farmers for quite cheap. For them to improve their yields, you know, the, the back, I don't know what you call it when they get money back for the produce that they sell um profit i guess <laughs> and uh, there must be a specific agriculture name that i a word vocabulary that i don't possess um and they were like yeah you can do that i'm like yes you can 100 percent do that and if you want i'll be more than happy to help you so i guess maybe that's what i've brought so i've spent now a long time in indonesia in total but i had a particular two months um, trip where I did, I call it a tour of in my, Indonesia, my Indonesian locations. I went to 15 uh, first ones where we want to build and did very long covers. So I spent four days in each. It was a lot of traveling. Don't ask me about my horrible carbon footprint. It's all for the greater <laughs> good. I feel horrible whenever people ask me. Yes, I could not sail from one to the other. It would mm. just take me a very long time and time is running out for this planet. So mm. I was like, okay. There's a priorities in, in, in this case, but I spent a lot of time just trying to show them how one little, let's say if my thing on global scheme is a little thing because the local people have so many other things going on, you know, waste is kind of their least of their priorities, but I can showcase them how this little change might have a really nice ripple of effect on all the other industries around and that that's my mindset so instead of destroying something how can we help and make things better so so far maybe that's the only thing i've done oh, <laughs> so i don't know about that cross that's, fingers it gets better <laughs> that's life changing and, and i think if you um you know wake people up and give them that consciousness that they they don't have to do things the same as they've always done them um, mm. and that there is a better way. I think just opening yes. their eyes is the, a big thing. Yes, and as well, it's not just about – So I met a lot of people in a lot of those locations that are very aware that it's a problem, but they they haven't seen that solution. Like mm. I've been lucky to be in recy- – like I've visited so many recycling centres in Europe uh, just even before when I was thinking how are we going to design this monster that we want to design 
um, just to see what does the best practice and then realizing a lot of it is way too expensive and will never work in Indonesian context. But you need that step. Like I needed mm. to go through that step to realize, so what is the best for the local context? Um, so they haven't seen and... I think culturally, there's definitely as well a difference, even from a language perspective, you know, mm. how people talk about environment, what environment means to you and I, because we speak English. And even I can say, because I speak a few more other languages in each of those languages, it has a bit of a different connotation. Yeah. Like, for example, Latvians originally, we are called the Buddhists of Europe because we love nature. Like we hug trees, we give names to all the animals. We're a bit weird. <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, yeah, we're very connected. You know, we walk barefoot all summer. It's it's just a thing. I don't know if you might be doing that in Australia too. <laughs> yeah, we do. But we're very rooted, very connected. Um, whereas for them, yeah, even the words, you'd have to like try explain what the connotation means to you mm. yeah, or like, yeah. That's it. Um you know, and uh, I'm just thinking about all that you've discovered and and explored so far on your journey. Um, what do you, what do you reckon has been your biggest challenge so far, and how have you overcome it? Mm, I think there's just been so many challenges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, so many. Can I list a few? Sure. Because I, I I don't think I'll have like one biggest one. So it will kind of be a bit anecdotal. Uh, mm. com- maybe, yeah. So I've realized that I'm really lucky. So my name is Samantha, but I never call myself Samantha. Nobody does. I always say Sam. Mm. Everybody calls me Sam. So I always sign all my emails with Sam. And I did not realize until I went to some first official meetings that actually Indonesians think that Sam is a man. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first thing. And it was quite interesting to see as well because it's such a technical field. Obviously, Indonesia is still quite, um, I don't even know what the word is, uh, that, you know, it's the men that do the technical things and yeah. the women do the Very nice traditional, things, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So when they see me and they're like, you're Sam. I'm like, yes. They say you can see you can see in the head they're going, she's a woman. But then you know, we've had several very technical email exchanges. So they mm. go back, oh, but she knows technical stuff because and you could it was like, but then sometimes, for example, if I do bring um my co-founder with me sometimes, uh, if the location permits and his time permits, or I would bring um, sometimes I have like the lo- local community would have a person that actually was the person who enabled me to meet these government officials. I would obviously go with that person. They would almost never look at me. They would look at him <laughs> and ask him the questions about waste management. And he'd be like, you need to ask her. She, she's the most <laughs> waste person, not me. I'm just here because I wanted her to speak to you. So that's been a very... I literally just let it glide over me because I just, I, I don't have time to now try and explain them gender yeah. equality. And all that. yeah. That's been for another decade, <laughs> another century. Uh, and, and I'm sure I'm breaking some stereotypes already. There has been many cases as well when I'm the only woman in a, in a room with 20 men, mm. uh, which is then again, I never see it as a disadvantage. I think they do listen when I talk. Um, and they're always surprised that I'm there talking technical things, even though I'm not at all that technical, really. And I don't have like an engineering background, you know. So I, I've used very simple words even for myself to be able to understand what I'm talking about. Um, so that's been quite an interesting challenge. Uh, they think, uh, I'm going to talk globally, uh, or a lot of look in a lot of locations, I've had experiences of them thinking I'm so precious that like I need bodyguards with me or I can't get on a boat by myself. And I'm literally like, guys, stop. I don't need tour guides. Like I know how to take a, a, you know, I I know how to say, (laughs) I can like take a boat. I can take a plane. Uh, And they're always very surprised. So I think even for some of my team in Indonesia who are female too, because I like to hire Mm. equally, Mm. uh, they're quite surprised. They're like, you're going to go by yourself. Like when I was doing the tour and, and I was like, yeah like I feel so safe in Indonesia Mm. you know this is not 
oh, I don't, I don't want to talk bad about any country, but it's like, I'm not going to the favelas in Colombia, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> without need a gun or something. Indonesia is such a safe country. And because I'm white and tourist, um, they think I'm a tourist. Uh, all eyes are on me and people would be very worried that something could happen to me. So that's, that's been an interesting challenge to just be like, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not going to fall apart if I get on a, <laughs> on, on a boat by myself. Mm. Um, I think I'm just wondering, probably kind of an overarching thing. It's just, you need to have a lot, a lot of patience. Yeah. And me as a person, I'm, very patient especially like with with this i knew this is not going to be an overnight thing i knew it's going to not be in in a year it's not i don't even know how long this is going to take until we can you know say we've actually making real impact but i always so i have a couple of friends who tell me it's going to be fine like be patient when i get really like kind of frustrated and angry that things aren't moving as fast as enough as fast as i would want them to move uh and then i say to my friends it's really not about me so much. And this will sound so, again, cliche. It's about this world doesn't have time. Mm. Like, I'm patient. I can be here another five years, ten years, you know, slowly chiming away in my in my thing, what I'm doing. <laughs> but in my head, I already know in all those locations that we've scouted and we want to do, it's thousands and thousands of tons of waste that are not managed on a daily basis. And that's what's making me... Oh, Every morning I wake up, I'm like, still not there. <laughs> yeah. But it keeps me going as well. So I guess that would probably be the, the kind of hardest. Keeping positive, being patient, but knowing the time is running out. So we should be quicker with these things. Yeah. And, um, you know, before, and I, I'm sorry to harp on about COVID, but before that happened, um, you know, people were out protesting about climate change those kind of things. Imagine if we treated the environment like a pandemic. You know, mm. there's something we have to be very protective of um, and actually, you know, it is an urgent thing we need to take care of now. Yeah. You know? Very, very sweet. Yeah, I wish people would have that mindset. But again, I guess even, you know how they say the the global kind of apathy, is that mm. the word? Yeah. Apathy of towards even climate change is just the words are so big we don't understand and it doesn't impact impact me today mm. so what's the point for example another thing that interests me a lot because i need to do some risk assessments when i think when i think about the locations and because indonesia is an archipelago and obviously we know there's um sea level is rising mm. i need to look at will that island exist in 20 years time yeah. because our operations is like 20 30 year agreements yeah right. and i need to kind of de-risk myself a little bit from well i'm not going to build it on an island that is super shallow and it will probably be under sea in 20 years because i know it will happen i'm wow. not one of those who need to be convinced that it will happen yeah so they've just released i think it was beginning of the year the new updated numbers and predictions because obviously you know there was a curve and now the curve is <laughs> even bigger and steeper and so they've updated the the, um, the maps and it's shocking like i i couldn't sleep for like a night or something because mm. i was so vietnam it's underwater bangkok is underwater part of iran is underwater which seems like well, what <laughs> but, but yes oh. um there's big big chunks as well in the uk that will be underwater so whoever if I don't know if you ever post links. Um, yeah, people just look up the newest maps of uh, sea level rise. I think it's a New York Times article mm. that includes the the really beautiful map link you can click on, and then you can zoom around anywhere you want to zoom around. Wow! And even that. So I live in Cambridge, and Cambridge will become almost a seaside town. So literally, Whoa. like you have all the there's like fens, they call it all this. That's a part of the UK coast that will just disappear. Yeah. And when I now talk to people here locally about it, they just, it's like, you can see there's like nothing registering mm. <laughs> and they're like, Oh, I want to buy a house in that city. And I'm like, that city literally in 20 years will be underwater. And, and there's nothing we can do. Like there's no money in this world. That's going to create 
you know, a whole coast being surrounded, like, like, please don't do that as well. You know, don't, don't put money in that. That's a nature happening to you. <laughs> Just don't live there, <laughs> move away, <laughs> buy some property somewhere else. But you can see that there's a dis- disassociation from what will happen in 20, 30 years. Hmm, who, who, whatever, we will see attitude. Yeah, well, I mean, all right, climate change. It just and now COVID is affecting us yeah. now today. It's making yeah. people die. So suddenly we're like, okay, I can be at home. I don't need to travel. Mm. Yeah, isn't it funny how how the shift happens and you know how us being in isolation has actually positively uh, impacted the environment. Like that alone, yeah. I think is is a big wake up for the earth. Um, but yeah. Wow, like I think having that consciousness I think is a big part of your message as well, you know, like um, whilst you're not having immediate impact, you're definitely um, getting in at the ground roots and trying to stop um, the issue. So I think, yeah, you're a karma, karma millionaire in my books. But um, uh, you, now you were talking about your future plans um, and that in Indonesia you're looking at like 20, 30-year kind of plans what what's happening in the immediate future for you? So up until when Indonesia started to have lockdown and forbid to travel, mm-hmm. uh, it was all going kind of according to the plan and what we were expecting. Um, time wise, it was timing was quite good because I had just finished my tour. I came back to UK in March, and that's when boom lockdown happened here. Yeah. I knew that Indonesia is a bit late on the schedule, so I was kind of already anticipating that. And our next steps, and literally what the whole team right now is working on, is feasibility studies. So each of those locations need quite large, extensive feasibility studies, which is good. That's how it should be. And I'm so, so glad that that's the step that the local um, governments have accepted and understand that that's what needs to happen. Mm. Um, So, And that can be done writing at home so literally everyone's you know Excellent. with themselves at home yeah. writing uh getting the statistics uh thankfully everyone in indonesia has smartphones whatsapp is you know their best friend yeah so it's really and even me communicating with my team everything's over whatsapp uh emails too but predominantly actually whatsapp so lots of communication um some locations are just a bit slower because you know the data is maybe stored on a computer that's at the office so they're like going to have to wait, which is fine. Um, And then next step normally after the feasibility study would have been for us to construct right away, which I was looking for to be probably August, September time. Mm -hmm. But due to what's happening, even in the five locations where the funding was found and approved, they now said we might have to postpone it to beginning of 21 because they obviously need to see if this funding needs to be diverted to their um, citizens, which I completely understand. Yeah. So it does feel a bit like a stick in the wheels. But at the same time, I mean, I think we should just, I'm very grateful, like that still I finished my tour. I met all the people. We know where we're going. It just might be a bit slower than, you know, anticipated. Again, patient, the earth might not be so patient. (laughs) Um, But as soon as we're allowed and um yeah construction can start uh and they might say okay actually it wasn't that bad and the funding is still there or you know the budget is still available in the in the bank we um will hopefully move forward if not we're still fundraising i mean still raising investment uh so who knows maybe one of our potential investors will say actually this has really concerned me and now i can see it even better mm. so is 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 the bunch of money and we'll be okay well we don't need your local funding we now have external funding and let's build it so i remain hopeful like this will not stop me mm. this will not um it will just make things maybe a bit slower which is okay the whole world is now going slower and maybe gives us the opportunity to focus and make sure that you know the numbers are right and um we can tweak the designs here and there and um you know, find other machine suppliers, you know, to, to diversify a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it's 
I, I always think, well, I'm not in this by myself. Yeah. I'm not the only person experiencing this. I have so many startup friends who are, you know, completely in like shutdown mode until things actually move where I feel for us still things are moving forward because we are yeah. writing the feasibility studies. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a good, good timing. And I'm very thankful that we're, we're there. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so you were just talking about fundraising and, or, or actually getting funding. Um, if people want to get involved and support you in the Ministry of Waste, how can they do that? Oh, good question. <laughs> Very sweet question. Um, I'd probably say, first of all, if you like what we do, if you like the idea of what we're trying to achieve, um, talk to other people about it. Like, I, I like that, even if just the message is being brought forward, that there are things happening and will be happening in Indonesia and in other developing countries. It's not looking so doom and gloom as people think you know like literally everybody thinks it's the end of the world and plastics is everywhere and we're eating plastics constantly uh, there there are things getting better and uh, people working for things to change us being one of them there's mm. many 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 others so please talk to us to other people and tell you know there there are things hopefully happening soon <laughs> um you see a lot of people tell me, oh, can we make a donation? Mm. And my first thought is, well, I don't feel very comfortable of normal people paying for something that should be paid more by the big companies that are contributing to this issue. Mm. So I would rather prefer that the funding comes from them rather than asking, you know, people to donate $20 or, or whatever. It's just seem doesn't sit with me quite well yeah so that's why if there's anyone out there thinking oh just put the donation <laughs> button on your facebook <laughs> no nah, it doesn't really sit with me so well so maybe let's just stick with talk about us talk about other solutions stay hopeful um maybe join us in terms of um maybe ministry of waste in the future uh, because right now, as I said, most team is Indonesian. If there's an Indonesian listening in Australia yeah. or the globe, let me know. I'll be interested to hear from you. Or from if there's people living in other countries and they say, I actually know we could move forward. Um, that would be interesting too. Um, but yeah, just and look at maybe look at other solutions uh, that are out there and try to support them too. Like, for example, with Flavio's mm. uh, New Oceans. That's such an amazing thing. I've talked to so many people about them. Like the, I have even my housemates, like last week, were asking me, so when are these flip-flops going to be made? We're like, yeah. I hope after COVID, yeah. uh, as soon as possible. Because she's like, well, my, my flip-flops are dying. I want to buy new ones. And I really would want to buy these ones. I'm like, well, that's what it is. Like support the people that are trying to have or are having an impact um, this way by the purchases you make. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and that was something. Yeah, I would, and, if, uh, yeah, and if you know investors, uh, tell us, tell them about us. <laughs> Maybe they'll be interested to to throw us a little bone <laughs> for us to move quicker forward. Yeah, I think um, you know it's. I think I was going to say if you didn't say it, is is the purchasing decisions that we make. I think is is a big thing that we can all do, no matter where we are. Um, that will help contribute to less waste. Um, but also, um, yeah, sharing that message and um, connecting people, I think, is the other thing. So um, something that I'm going to share with you when we get off air is you're actually going to become a custodian of collective change and you're going to be connected with people who can help you on your mission. And I know a number of people who can help you. And um, so, yeah this podcast does change lives so be ready <laughs> uh, yeah. well I hope I can be helpful too so absolutely <laughs> it's a two-way street now um I do have a couple of big questions left for you Sam one of them is what does being ethical mean to you probably again very, very holistic system thinking yeah so it's whatever you do, whatever, anything you put in your mouth, everything you wear, your footprint on this planet in general, um, but as well with people. So it's like a global thing. 
how do you what's the best or what's the how can you be the best version of yourself while making sure you're not hurting others so to say um I'm a vegetarian myself but I do never I never preach to other people to be vegetarian and I always yeah. tell my friend tell my friends I'm not judging you but I hope that when you purchase your meat you know you purchase it rather twice a week from the good butcher that you know that the cow had a really good life yeah <laughs> you know like hug the cow it probably had a name <laughs> it comes from a Latvian farm or something silly <laughs> like um so ethical for me means um just living kind of thinking of others not just of yourself absolutely of self. yeah I don't know if, if I answered that right <laughs> oh there's no wrong or right answer to that and everyone I ask that question of it is completely different depending upon you know your experience and um you nailed it absolutely nailed it um so here's the big one for you <laughs> what's the change you'd like to see in the world and how can we bring it to life I really love um, something I saw online. So I might be repeating myself if someone already has said it. There was this meme or whatever you call it that circulated around and that said, the world doesn't need, um, you know, millions of like hundreds of perfect zero waste people. The world needs everyone doing as much as they can to be as much possibly better. So instead of having hundred zero waste people having millions of less like less waste people yeah. and i think people need to understand that everything you do amounts like we are a small drop but all together like look at this pandemic yeah. i think it's a perfect example one person can make thousands of people sick think about the same for what you do to this planet like you one person look at your bin Think of how you consume, consume differently. I love my little sister wrote me uh, the other day and said, I bought a bamboo toothbrush. I'm like, I'm so proud of you. Now make sure you give bamboo toothbrushes to all your friends for their birthdays. And she's like, that's exactly what I'm about to do. I'm like, well, see, this is the thing. Like the little ripple effect that you have on yourself, but then how that ripples down to all the people around you. And that is, but we need to do it quicker that's the only that's thing it. I think it's my mantra we don't really have that much time so we need to be quicker with the change change yourself and then maybe hopefully you will influence the people around you yeah that's what I would say is the change it's that whole mission of collective change which is what this podcast is all about, <laughs> about. my agency is <laughs> okay. all about um so I could not agree with you more and speaking of bamboo toothbrushes I also have converted to that like a year ago and um, I get the subscription one, so I don't even have to buy a toothpaste. Oh, sorry, a toothbrush at the supermarket. It's just it gets sent to it's me, super, and perfect. all all in recycled packaging. Make your life, yeah, and they're trying to make your life so easy already by just saying you're not even gonna have to make an effort. Just click here, put your details in. It's gonna be shipped to you. Yeah, and if you don't use it because your previous one is good, you just gift it to someone, right? Yeah, like don't even have to think. Oh yeah, no, I have hundreds of toothbrushes at home it's not that bad yeah so yeah and that's it you know like um you could use a plastic one for I don't know so long and it would not degrade but the bamboo ones do actually degrade because you're using it yeah. and it's a natural product so it's a bit of a no-brainer for me anyway I'm not going to preach on but um yeah, yeah. there's so many things in my life I've changed in in that way and it's made my life actually easier like toilet paper toothbrushes things like that you know Yep. So much easier. Agreed. <laughs> oh, Sam, this has been amazing. I can't thank you enough for being a part of the ethical evolution. Thank you for having me. It was lovely to be able to tell our story, even if there isn't much impact just yet. <laughs> sit, <laughs> sit Don't hold your breath, but sit still in your seat. It's going to happen. It's coming. It's coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for everyone listening. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution Podcast. If you're an ethical business owner, change maker or holistic healer who's determined to make a change in the world and you need support to spread your message, visit ethicalchangeagency.com to collaborate.
Miles, are you ready to record our promo for season two of the Wanna Bet podcast? David, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Miles, we're not here to quote lines from Airplane. We're here to tell people that season two starts August 18th. But I like Airplane. I know you do, but Wanna Bet is a sports betting podcast. Each week we bet $1,000 on the NFL teams and games that we love. Well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric Acid. Electric Acid. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonize your mind, body, and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together we explore vibrations, frequencies, and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress, and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Electric Acid.